Hello, this is Rabbi Sammy Bergman, and we are now going to learn the ninth parak of Mishnah Sanhedrin. First part of the uh, parak talks at the beginning of the Elohim Misrafin, and the Mishnah lists a number of different people who are liable for sreifa, burning. There are four types of death, or ways of adjudicating death penalty. Um, we previously discussed the Skalin, stoning, and this chapter discusses the Misrafin, people who get, or, or who receive death via burning. And the Mishnah begins, I'll read it very quickly, with a list of Arayos, um, instances of sexual immorality that warrant death penalty. So, Ha'el, Ha'el, Misrafin, these are the people that are burned. Ha'bal, Yeshua, Bitsa, someone who has relations with a mother and her daughter. Ba'koin, Shazinta, and a, the daughter of a Kohen, who also um, has illicit relations. Yish, Bechlal, Yeshua, Bitsa. If included in this category of a woman and her daughter means you cannot have a relationship with a person, a daughter, one's own daughter, or with the daughter of or one's granddaughter, or with one's son's daughter, or with one's wife's daughter, or with one's daughter's daughter, or with one's daughter's uh, or with, sorry, your wife's granddaughter, or one's wife's son's daughter, or your mother-in-law, or with your mother-in-law's grandmother, or your um, father's grandmother. So all permutations of having relations both with a woman and either their grandmother, or granddaughter, or daughter, or mother, mother-in-law, grandmother-in-law, all those things, get Sreifa. Now the Mishnah moves on to people who get chenek, or not rather not chenek, um, hereg. Hereg is death by the sword. And what ends up becoming a discussion about what you need to be liable for murder. So the, the list is pretty small. A murderer and the people of a, a city that together commit idolatry. So, Rotsash he can now the Mishnah talks about what does it what what do I have to do to be a murderer? Rotsash he could Rayu Bavno Bavarza. Again, a very tragic discussion, but one that's actually very fascinating. A murderer that hits a his friend with a stone or with iron. The Kavash Allah Batocha Mayam Tocha or or let's say you don't directly strike them, but rather you you force them into the water, into fire, then Yachalalo Misham in such a way that they cannot Escape, but mate, and then they die. Chayav, you are chayav. Okay, so we have two types essentially. We have a, a case in which you hit them directly, which causes their death, with the type of um, blow that has the potential to kill them, or you prevent them from escaping their death by forcing them into the water into fire. Okay, it's interesting. If you push them into the water or into fire, and then you leave them alone, and they had the capability of getting out of that situation by themselves, but they don't do so, then you are pator, you are exempt. Um, interesting question why this may be. One could suggest it's because at that point, they are killing themselves. It is not you that, that is killing them. She kaled, she nachash pator. What if you see a wild dog and you incite that dog to attack someone, or you incite a snake to attack them? That is also exempt, because that is not direct causation. It is indirect. It is what we call grama. You are indirectly causing their death. You are not directly killing them, and that is exempt from the death penalty. So now we have an argument. What if you literally take the snake and you pick it up and bring it close to the person, and then the snake bites them. Um, does that constitute murder? Rabbi Huda Machai, Rabbi Huda says, you are, you are liable in that case. Pacham say you are exempt. Why are you exempt? The Gemara still says that it's still Gorim. The Chacham say that ultimately what killed the person? It was the snake, not you. You brought the snake close to them, but it was still considered indirect um, an indirect murder, and you are exempt from the death penalty for indirect murder. It's worth noting that if Basin finds you guilty, even though you're not Minatora Chayev Misa, they have the right to prosecute you anyway, but you are not Chayev Misa for an indirect murder. 
Hamakes chaveru ben be'evim ben be'ergo ba'amdu l'misa. A person hits their friend either with their fist or with a stone, and the doctors say he's uh, he's on his deathbed. This will cause him to die. And beheko mash hayal acher mikam hebe b'meis chayav. If they're on their death, then all of a sudden they get better, miraculously, and then they get sick again and die. So Chacham says you're still chayav. Nachemia Omer patra shiraglaim medaver. Nachemia says no, you're exempt shiraglaim medaver. There's a circumstantial evidence, evidence which indicates that um, that you didn't actually kill them. Um, some actually say that raglaim medaver is really referring to the Chachamim. The Chachamim say the fact that they got better means it wasn't you that caused their death. So this is an argument between the Chachamim and Reb Nechemia. If you hit someone in such a way that should cause their death, and then they miraculously heal, and then only to ultimately die afterward, is such a person chaya for a tzicha? Um, does that constitute direct causation of death? The Chachamim say, no, yes it does. Reb Nechemia says, no, it does not. The next Mish talks about the nature of kavana. What intent do you need to be chaya misa? A person was trying to kill an animal and they accidentally kill a person. Even though it's forbidden to kill a non-Jew, you don't get the death penalty for doing so. And a person tried to kill a non-Jew and instead they kill a Jew. They were trying to kill somebody who was going to die anyway. Someone who was, uh, who was dying, in the process of dying. And instead they kill someone who was perfectly healthy. Potter. You are exempt, meaning you are only chaya for a if you intended to kill someone who um, was a full-fledged living Jew and would, whose murder would result in the death penalty, and you actually killed them. If you didn't actually mean to kill someone who um, is chaya, who you'd be chaya misa for, you don't get the death penalty. So you meant to hit the person in the waist. And you didn't hit them so hard that you would kill them by doing so. And then all, you miss, you hit them in the, near their heart, which is a much more lethal location. And it was strong enough, you hit them hard enough to kill them by hitting them there. However, you're still exempt because you didn't intend to kill them in that way. The way that you meant to hit them, they wouldn't have died until you slipped. It doesn't constitute intent to murder. If you intended to hit them in their heart, and that would have been enough. But then you miss, you hit them in the waist. So then you end up hitting them in the waist. And we know that you didn't hit them hard enough in the waist to kill them, because it wasn't that hard. And yet they die anyway. We still say you're exempt, because here you're la- you need two things. You need both the intent to murder, and you need an actual blow, which has the potential to murder. If you're lacking either one of them, either the intent or the strength, the force of the blow, you are exempt. A person meant to kill an adult, and they miss, and they kill a katan. So you you strike an adult, but you didn't strike that. You didn't mean to strike the adult that hard, but you miss, and you hit a child, unfortunately. Hospice should almost things should happen, then you kill the child. You're still exempt because you didn't intend to kill anybody. You meant to hit somebody who would take that type of blow. Again, the same thing. If you're lacking the intent, you have the intent, but you're lacking the actual blow. You meant to hit a child. It was strong enough to hit the child, and you should have been high of Misa for hitting the child, but you missed the hit the gadol, you hit the adult. And you're tied, the blow that you inflicted upon this adult should not have been enough to kill them, and yet they die anyway. You are exempt. But if you have both intent and the blow, but you just miss, you meant to hit the guy in the waist, and you meant to hit him hard enough to kill them, but you miss and you hit them in the chest, near their heart, and that kills them, and that was strong enough, you're still chayyab. You meant to hit an adult, and you were meant to kill the adult. And you hit the hit them very hard, but you hit the wrong person, you you are still chayyab. That's the Tanakama's opinion. The Tanakama holds that if you meant to kill person A, who's a full-fledged adult, um, 
where you're high of Ritzicha for killing, even or even a child. You're, you're high of for killing either an adult or a child. If you've meant to kill person A and you miss and kill person B, as long as you had your attempt to murder and you hit them hard enough that it constitutes murder, even if it was the wrong person, you're high of. However, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Shimon says, no, even in such a case when you had the intent and you did the act which you had the potential to murder, if you get the wrong person, you're still not high of for Ritzicha. Mishnah moves on to say what happens in a really pretty crazy case if we have a mixture of people and we don't know which ones um, are liable for which penalty. You have a murderer who gets mixed up with other people. And we're now... Um, um, and we don't know which or you have a case when Gemara talks about you have two people in a crowd and you see that one of them fired an arrow to kill someone. You don't know which one. The Kanakama says they're putter. You don't know where Konten Osa Lakipa. So Rabbi says, no, you do something called kipa. Kipa is pretty grotesque. It means you don't kill them directly, but you essentially starve them. You put them in a room until, and only feed them until, um, and you essentially feed them food, which ultimately causes their stomachs to implode. It's a very gruesome thing, but we don't want to, it's a case where we don't want to kill them explicitly because you don't know which one. Um... However, the Gemara says that this doesn't seem to be very logical. It can't be a case where Behuda thinks that one of these people didn't murder and we killed both of them. So the Gemara explains that he was actually talking about a different case. He's talking about a case of an, an ox that killed that got mixed up with other oxen. So one opinion is you stone all of them. Behuda says, no, don't stone any of them. You put them in a pen. But everybody agrees if you don't know which person killed, you can't kill either of them. What about if you have a bunch of people that are all high of Misa, but we don't know what death penalty to give them? So the Mishnah says, and it's gone in Misrafim. What if you have people that are high of Skila, high of for stoning, and some that are high of for burning, and you don't know which one's which? Shimon Omer, and you don't know the Skila, Chamur. Shimon says, so now we have an argument. Um, the question is, which we should give them? So Shimon says, you, you, you want, you, everybody agrees you give them the more lenient penalty. But what's more lenient, burning or stoning? And I guess if you had pulled 100 people, would they rather be stoned or have hot lead thrown down their throat? Rabbi Shimon says they all get skila because Shreifa is Hamura. Since Shreifa is considered more stringent, a worse way to die, give all of them skila because you don't know which one to give them. The, 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 the sages, the Chacham, argue now you have a mixture of people who are high of Shreifa and high of skila. So you give them Shreifa, you get, burn them. Why is that? Because Shreifa is considered more lenient than Skila, and you have to give them the more lenient penalty. So essentially, we have an argument between Rishimun and the Chacham as to which is considered worse, Shreifa or Skila. Rishimun says Shreifa is worse, the Chacham say Skila is worse. Shimon says, clearly Shreifa is worse, because if it wasn't worse, the Torah wouldn't give it to a Bas Kohen to Zinsa, the daughter of a Kohen who... Um, has an affair, we we give her Shreifa. It must be really, really bad. Chum say, what do you mean? I'll give you another proof. If Skilo wasn't even worse, wasn't worse, we wouldn't give it to a Megade, someone who blasphemes, and to someone who serves an idol. So now you have another case. Those are the two higher cases of murder. What if you have people who are high of Hareg, uh, death by the sword, and you have some who are high of Nechenek, which is death by hanging. So which one is the worst? Rabbi Shimon or Rabbi Shimon Rabbi Shimon says that in such a case where those people are mixed up, you give them Hareg. Why? Rabbi Shimon says that death by the sword is more lenient than death through hanging. You give them Chenek. Hareg is considered worse. Chenek is considered more lenient. So again, now you have a second Machlokas. Which is worse, Hareg or Chenek? Rabbi Shimon says... Chanak is worse, the Chacham say Hareg is worse, therefore, if you have a mixture, then only you get the more lenient penalty. Mishnah says a person that is liable for two death penalties, they do something which makes them high for two different things. So the Mishnah says you get the more strict punishment. 
Aver Avera Shiesh Beshe Misos. If you if you commit a sin which has two different misos. For instance, a person has relationship uh, has relations with their mother in law, who's also married. So they get Shrefa for their mother in law and Chenek for having relations with a married woman. Nidabachamura. So you get the stricter punishment. Yossi argues in the Tana Kama and says, no, you get whatever sentence happened first. So if you did two different sins, whichever sin you did first is the punishment you get for that sin. Now the Mishnah extends from judicial punishments to sort of extrajudicial punishments. When you punish someone not for you know one of these four official death penalties, but they're an egregious violator, you punish them otherwise. Mishalaka Vishana, a person that got Malkus, and they keep doing the Avera. Basin Machnison Salachipa. If you do it three times, says the um, Gemara, you do the same sin three times, you got lashes one time, you got lashes a second time, the third time, we bring you into the prison. And essentially, until you um, starve. Umachir also Masora Chakresa Mispakas. You feed the person barley until their stomach implodes. So essentially, we have a way of punishing sinners who won't get the official death penalty, but we see that they're, um, you know, negatively affecting society with, with their sins, and therefore we we, we punish them extrajudicially outside of court. Someone who kills someone without witnesses. So we have like another case, right? This is the point, really important point here, which is that they're part of what Sahedrin is all about is that on the one hand we have very strict punishments for certain sins but those that punishments are only adjudicated in very very limited circumstances you need to be warned you need witnesses so what if you have someone that killed we know they killed but it was without witnesses we can't we can't try them so same thing we bring them into the jail and we feed them instead of saorim okay so first actually first we feed them bread and wine, um, very thin bread, and and I guess um, water, not what wine. Feed them water, which is a very small amount of water, and afterward um, you feed them this barley, when, and which makes their, their stomach implode. Either way, they get the same punishment. So there's a way for basin to punish someone in such a way that that even if we can't get them the death penalty, we got them otherwise. Now the Mish talks about another. A case, a case where you can actually take the law into your own hands. Hagoni Veslakasva, someone who steals Klishare, steals a vessel which is meant to be used in the Bena Mikdash. And this is a case who someone who curses God with the name of Vodazara. Behaboel Aramit, and someone who publicly has relations with a non Jewish woman, Kanut in Pogimba. So this means people who are zealous. People, righteous people who are filled with wrath over this gross violation of God's word are going to kill that person even without jurisdiction, even without um, adjudicating the case in court. Kohen to Shemesh Batuma. If you have a Kohen who is Tame, who is uh, impure, and they say, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm serving in the Mikdash anyway, even though I'm Tame. So it says the Kohanim don't have to bring him to court. Rather, you get the young Kohanim to bring him outside. And you break open his brain with, uh, with twigs and sticks um, for doing this sin of, of purposefully serving in the, in the, in the Mikdash while Tomei. Finally, what is the punishment for a non kohen who serves in the Mikdash? Rabbi Kiva Omer Bachanek, Rabbi Kiva says, Chanek, which is death by strangulation, by hanging. Chacham Ormim Beish Shemayim, and Chacham say, no, it's just a heavenly punishment. You can't kill them. Um, the punishment for a non kohen who serves in the Mikdash, according to the Chachamim, is, is not a punishment in this world, but it's a Misa Bide Shemayim. And that ends Perek Hess.